Welcome to the longest longsword video you may ever watch in your life. However, it could be the only longsword video that you need in your life. I'm the Bachata Knight. I fight out here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with Pittsburgh Armored Combat. And I'm pretty good at longsword. At least that's what people tell me. <laughs> so, just to be clear, this is about fighting longsword duels one-on-one -on -one in armor, like in armored combat or boo hurt. We're gonna cover things in this video to help you win. So whether you're totally new to this and you have no clue about anything with fighting longsword, you're gonna learn a lot. Whether you already do it, you just think you wanna up your game by hearing things that I have to say how to improve, all for you, this video. Even if you're very experienced and you think you know it all, I have right here the longsword meta. So watch and tell me if you think that you agree or if you think I'm wrong. And if, if I'm wrong, leave a comment. I'd love to hear anything that anybody has to say. So leave a comment anytime during this video. Actually, it'd be a great time just to even like the video and share it with anybody on this planet that you think could learn something about longsword today. So, what is great about a longsword duel? Unlike sword and shield or sword and buckler, where you're throwing and you can also have defense at the same time, longsword, and I'd say even more than polearm, every time you hit someone, they can hit you back. There are ways to avoid being hit as many times while you throw a strike, and we'll cover things like that later. But one thing, if you're ever gonna be great at longsword, you have to be able to get through your head as you're going to be hit. You have to have a little bit of a pain tolerance because sometimes you have to throw all worries out the window and attack. And when you attack, they will attack you. That's what makes longsword really cool. So, Bachata, how do you win in a longsword duel? The secret is, to hit them just one more time than they hit you. Honestly, that's it. I take that back. You need to hit them maybe three more times than they hit you because a lot of times the judges can't count. So we're gonna get started. Let me tell you real quick uh, what qualifies me to make this video, how I discovered the meta, how I stubbornly decided to accept it and why it's changed my life to win so much more. And then I'm gonna break down the meta into some different parts. If you can't do at least a few of these parts and check them off your checklist of things that you can do to be good at longsword, you're never gonna place top five at a national event. Now, if you're just doing this for fun, you're gonna learn a lot of things to up your game. I, I swear to you, you will. And things that I do and people, why they say I'm good at entertaining at longsword, you're gonna learn that too. I'm revealing everything in this video. What are my qualifications? Okay, a lot of these medals behind me, are from Fighting Longsword. As a matter of fact, I got one this weekend for Fighting Longsword, and it was a grueling match, and I followed the meta that I'm gonna share with you today, and that's the only reason I won. It went three rounds, and if I had not had this mindset, I would not have won. I would not have got this gold medal, which we will place up here, with the other ones that I have no clue what to do with. So, a lot of these medals are from like small tournaments. I win a lot of tournaments. Like I won first place over the weekend at one. Uh, the last one I went to, I got second place because my, my teammate, who's also really good, Chris Saner, won first. He always usually wins first. It's like me and him always fight in the finals. It's actually a fun time. So that's how I, I, I would say I would be qualified to make this video. Plus so many people come up to ask in, in person about tips and things or refer them to me for some tips that I, I think I really need to share things on me and how I look at longsword and what I do to win. So what is the meta? How did I discover it? Over the last two years, okay, I said never meddled at a national event. However, I've gotten placed pretty high. Carolina Carnage, two years ago, I was like fourth or fifth place. I don't know because I didn't get a medal, but that's what my record would have been. Last year, I was dead last because I didn't follow the meta. When I started Longsword, I was all about doing fancy stuff. That's why people would say I'm really entertaining. A lot of things that I learned back in the day in like German Longsword translate to fighting in armored combat duels. You know, we just can't stab, but a lot of things you do translate. And I think that's why, because I do things like that a lot, and it was different from everybody else, so they thought like, oh, I'm like really good. I would still win. However, as people have been getting competitive in this and getting better and raising the bar, all the fancy stuff, just no longer cuts it. So, what the meta is, I'm about to reveal this to you. So pay attention. Very first, what I put on the top of the list is practice quantity. Quantity is what is going to win no matter what. We're gonna have a 
two different types of quantity that I'm going to talk about when I go and we define all these things in depth. You must be able to throw strikes and so many of them that people think you're a lunatic out there. Next would be min-maxing your armor. So we're going to go over that first. I'm going to show you some things, some tips to help with your armor. But you need to be able to be mobile. You need to be able to be flexible. You cannot be out there expecting to win first place wearing your melee kit. And this is as far as your arms go up. And this is like the range of motion you have right here. However, if that's what you're stuck with, when we get on the Pell here in a little bit, I'm going to show you ways to improve your longsword game and save some energy in that heavy armor set that you're wearing. Min-max your armor. Titanium if possible. A lot of people are just wearing like jack chains on a side with, an, with shoulders and an elbow cup and little tiny teardrop shoulders. Like I said, that thing where you have to accept a little bit of pain. Min-max your armor. You might get a couple bruises, but you're going to be so much faster, much more flexible, increased range of motion. Next, like I said in the very beginning, you have to have that pain tolerance or willing to accept being hit. If you're always concerned about being hit when someone's when you're attacking and they're going to hit you back, you're never going to place top five. Actually, you might not even have as much fun if you're always holding back. The last part of the meta that may upset a lot of people out there is forget about historical medieval footwork. It does not matter. And, and a, a big part neither does actual form. You can toss medieval footwork, historical form of swing swords, out the window. Throw them out each window. Do not matter. Okay, so I'm going to get started on the very basic stuff. A lot of you may know this. Some of you may not, especially if you're just getting into this. A gauntlet appears. So there's my band brace, right? So check this out. This is a great example of min-maxing armor when it comes to range of motion. See how wide this is? See this hourglass? It actually binds. This is as far as this will go. Let's see, I'm actually forcing it. Okay? It rolls around like this. No good for fighting longsword. Now, keep in mind, if you just don't have money to buy different kinds of armor, this is no problem. We're going to go over some things later. I'll show you great ways to improve your longsword game without spending uh, money on a whole new set of armor. But I would really suggest what you do is like what I did here. This is my armor. Oh, so this is titanium. Look how light this is. This is the lightest armor that I could afford. Titanium. These wrists right here, see how skinny these are? Check out this gauntlet on these. <laughs> I got so much range of motion in my wrists, it's godlike. These are Gritter Gauntlets. I actually do think I'm going to get a different set of gauntlets for duels. You need to make sure, when I got these measured, I measured my wrist with the soft kit on, and I had I choked it down a little bit, actually subtracted a little bit, so it'd be really tight. It may be tight on my wrist, but oh my, can I move my hands pretty much any way I want. Min-maxing armor. This is titanium. You saw me throwing it around how light it is. The shape is also very important. I will probably always prefer to have this much coverage on my arms, except up here. Reason is, when I lift up my sword, see how that plate goes? It makes me extra wide. The true min-maxed armor is a shape like this. Actually, a lot of people even have quite a gap here because it doesn't cover all the way. A pauldron that is like the teardrop shape or a circle is the way to go. My pauldron, I look like a beetle when I put my arms up above my head. Like the, the hard covering on the wings when I'm like this, they actually stick out. I don't like it because I can be clipped. Makes me a wider target. Material, titanium. Or if you're just really good and got the endurance, you get steel that fits you very well. Like I said about the, um, the arms there, the wrists, range of motion. Let me show you my brig. My brig, also titanium, very light, okay? You know why I don't fight melee in this? Because look, this is all my back is. That's it. 
minimum coverage. I have some pretty wide open gaps up here and down here by my hips. I put two plastic inserts in my gambeson to cover those gaps, but I do get hit there and it hurts. It doesn't hurt so bad that I can't fight longsword and I put up with it, but you know I have so much more range of motion I can totally bend over and touch my toes while I'm wearing this. Now this is more like a sword and shield or buckler tip, but why is this thing so beat up? Because I don't wear a tabard. And why don't I wear a tabard? Because when you're leaning forward and things like that and you have a long tabard on, sometimes it drapes down and people will hit it with, your, with their sword and a judge will think that's a hit. I'm so against tabards, they're gonna enact this new tabard rule where you have to have a tabard. If I do, I'm getting as short as possible. You don't want it hanging down any further than it needs to because it's gonna look like a hit to a judge that doesn't know any better. You wanna know something even crazier? So this gambeson right here, very thin, it's like, if this is like a hoodie, okay, uh, I'll just show you. See, I got some yoga mats. Where I bend, yoga mats are my protection, where the gaps are. Where I don't bend, hard plastic plates. Where you bend, yoga mats. That's my tip, at least, for armor. So here's, here's something crazy, you know what? Some people don't even wear gambeson. You could consider that. Some people wear a gi, the karate thingy, you know? Uh, there are people out there that wear like an athletic shirt and their armor goes over top, no gambeson. may sting a little bit, but think of all that weight you save, all the flexibility you have when everything's tied down, you probably even get a little bit extra range of motion because your gambeson isn't hung up on something else. The last thing about min-maxing your armor I'm gonna mention is your field of vision. I love this helmet, but I can't see anything out of it. Little tiny eye bar like that, I'm not experienced in those kind of helmets. If you are, or if that's your look, that's great. Just make sure you're able to see your opponent. Field of vision is very important. It's not something I think that matters too much in the end because a lot of times you don't even need to see uh, specifically when you're throwing shots as long as you know about where your opponent is, but you need to be able to react to them and you need to see where their hands are at all times. My range of motion tip for fighting longsword or really any duel in it for that matter is to get yourself one of these. See this cylinder right here? This is what you do with it. You put it on the ground and you get on top of it and use this to help expand your chest, be able to bring your arms back. You can do all kinds of exercises for it. What I really recommend is looking up a video on how to use one of these. Or like take a Pilates class. I swear by it, I've taken Pilates and I've swung my sword around my range of motion is so much better. But you want to be able to expand your range of motion, and this is an exercise that will do it. Range of motion is just so important in dueling. I can't stress it enough. And that's some basic stuff, so that's why we covered that first. Now, moving on to the next easiest thing to say, the pain tolerance thing, right? So if I'm raising my sword up, what's this guy here gonna do? He can hit me in the arms here, you can hit me in the ribs. A lot of times people will hit you here. When they do, of course you hit them back at the same time, right as if you gotta throw that fear out the window. You're getting hit, but you're hitting them. I'm hitting them, I'm probably getting hit again. I'll cover some things later on how we can throw strikes and do things to avoid being hit while we're attacking. But as you can see, pain tolerance, he might hit me in the arms with one of these, he might hit me in the ribs or the hips. You need to be able to accept that you're going to get hit in return. You swing, they hit you, but you're hitting them. You can't always guard yourself. Pain tolerance, you have to have a pain tolerance. It's a must to be a real good longswords dueler. The next part of the meta, which might make some people furious, is that medieval, like historical sword fighting footwork does not matter in armored combat boo hurt. Does not matter one bit. Let me show you an example. All right, I put on some white shoes to show you this. This is like medieval footwork, right? Gathering step, okay? Now, let me ask you this. Why did people focus on that movement, right? Because I'm coming this way Stabbing. We don't stab. Okay, maybe this keeps you balanced, right? You know what else is balanced? Just walking around. You walk around every day. I'm not saying you have to walk any different. 
do what you feel comfortable comfortable with just walking around to enter exit doesn't matter you don't need to have medieval period footwork there's a couple people out there that fight in armor you know that i've fought against most beautiful duelist as far as form and things like that like i was saying even proper form doesn't matter as long as you're hitting somebody in this sport <clears throat> great people to watch fight you know who, who i've seen them get beat by people just walking around i'm gonna go this way you know footwork doesn't matter think of it like chess a rook forward and back is isn't gonna side straight line right you don't need it. You don't need it. Do what feels comfortable. If you feel comfortable staying out here, you want to walk up to somebody like you walk like normal. You want to chase somebody down like normal. Do it. Don't waste your time on medieval footwork, learning anything like that. Oh, like I said about the strikes, you really don't have to care about that either. Technically, you do. <clears throat> so like in HMB and stuff, you can't just go like this. You have to actually have some kind of a swing, right? I think they want like a 45 degree swing, okay? That's what I aim for. But you can watch video of many top level tournaments where stuff like this counts as two hits. We'll count that as two points. It wasn't like this, like medieval kind of style or where you're throwing and gripping it doesn't matter people are landing hits like this as long as it's hard enough these days now they might put a rule in here this is october 2023 they might put a rule in there one day it says okay you have to come like this you have to have some kind of uh arc on your swing and technically i think it is a rule but people these days are in tournaments and doing stuff like this And those are counting as hits. I suggest you train for a more proper form with your sword strikes. It's not the way it is these days. Right now, the meta is hit them, even if it's something like this. Those are all counted as good strikes. Throw historical period manuscript style footwork out the window we don't stab you don't need to go in a straight line you don't need to be so conformed that if someone rushes you you're doing medieval footwork do it feels comfortable walk around like normal i would suggest you have a nice a nice form with an arc people aren't judging it that way the longsword meta does not require any kind of medieval form or footwork whatsoever. That might rustle a few scale skirts, but seriously, as a matter of fact, a perfect example, go check out the Cincinnati Siege 2023 duels video by Timothy Hines. Uh, and you can watch this entire video I'm making right now. Tell me who won the longsword duels. It's the people with the min-max armor. It's the people who, they don't have any kind, no one there actually had any kind of crazy medieval footwork. It's the people who didn't care about getting hit. And as we're about to talk to next, the most important part of the meta is quantity. And we're going to talk about in two different, two different ways I'm going to define quantity. And you watch that video, tell me who won. It's all people that follow this of the longsword meta is quantity. And we're going to talk about it in two ways. The first way is you need to be able to train. Uh, so obviously you need endurance, okay? You need to have endurance to go say like 16 rounds okay and there's obviously different leagues with different time limits there might be just a 190 second round that's all you got you might have like a best of three out of 60 seconds which if there's a tie you could go four you could go five rounds so i think at minimum you need to be able to train for 16 rounds and that's 16 rounds of sometimes you might have a couple minutes off in between sometimes you might have like 10 minutes off sometimes you're fighting and then you're skipping maybe a duel and then you're up again. So you need to have the endurance to do this stuff. The quantity overall. Okay, check this out. 90 second duels, 60 second duels. 
divide it in half. That is how many strikes minimum that you need to be able to throw in a round. 90 second round, you need to be able to throw at least 45. Actually, great example. Cincinnati Siege, who won second place, how many points did they throw? 42. It was 42 to 36 in 90 seconds. So check this out. Quantity comes down to how many you can throw in a round. You need to be able to throw at least half of the seconds of that round, what the rules are. 90 second round, you need to be able to throw 45 strikes. 16 times when you practice, you need to be able to do this. The same thing with like a 60 second round, you need to be able to throw 30, but you better be able to throw more than that when I'm recommending. Arnold Fitness, I got I got fourth place in long sword. It was, and it was literally like my 16th duel of the day. I already done sword and shield and, and uh, I think Buckler was after that. I threw, uh, me and McCartney threw 70 strikes. Like somebody counted it. It was that late in the day and we each still threw 70 strikes in 90 seconds. Now, this brings me to the point. Quantity is great. You need to be able to throw like 45 and upwards strikes in 90 seconds. However, no one wants to do that. And when we get into strategies, I'll tell you exactly how I fight. You, no one wants to throw 70 strikes, but some people will come at you and force you to. You need quantity overall. The other definition of quantity that I'm gonna talk about is combos. No one who wins top spots throws less than like five hits in a combo. If you can throw three, that's great. Aim for five or six. Some combos go even farther, nine, 10. You need to be able to throw at least five strikes in a row, be able to take a step back, rest for a second, throw five more, rest for a second, throw five more. So you have definition one of quantity, overall how many you can throw in a round. Number two, how many you can throw like in a combo. So here's the thing, if you're being beat by somebody who's really good, who's the longsword meta, you will not be throwing that many strikes because they're gonna know they're ahead and they're not gonna waste all their time bothering with you constantly throwing. You don't wanna win by 20 points. It's a waste of energy, right? They'll stand there, they'll hit you if you get close or make a dumb mistake. However, if they're behind, they will come at you and hit you relentlessly. Five hit combos, eight hit combos. There might be a gap in time of 15, 20 seconds where it's continuous they're just continually striking you. I mentioned that medal that I won yesterday, right? You know why? Because I stuck to the meta. Multiple hit combos, I was throwing at least probably five strikes at a time before we'd take a, a step back, throw another. When I was behind, I would spend probably at least 15 seconds of relentless back and forth and try and switch it up so it's not just left, right, left, right, but I needed to be able to throw to outlast my opponent that many strikes. And it was probably, quicker than one strike per second. You need to be able to train to throw 70 strikes. <laughs> you might not ever get there, but train for it. Train to be able to throw at least half the number of strikes as the amount of time you get in your round. Quantity in a combo. Be able to throw five or six strikes easily. Be able to take a quick step back to rest. And be ready to do it again. If you are winning against someone who's really good, and does this, they're going to come at you and do that to you. So you need to be able to equal them. Remember, longsword is just about hitting them one more time than they hit you. Let me put it into like an analogy, okay? We're gonna have a pumpkin smashing contest. Who can smash a pumpkin the most amount of times? Player A, player B. You give them a mallet. Player A hits it 16 times. Player B had enough energy to hit it 52 times. Who's got the better smash pumpkin? Player B. You see it all the time. People show up to these longsword duels and throw like 20 strikes in 60 seconds. And that's totally fine. A lot of times the opponent, their opponent does too. And it's a match of, it comes down to 7 verse 3. 8 verse 11. Okay. You get to these big tournaments and it's, 42 to 36, you know, 50 <laughs> to seven, because the person that did seven only threw 16 times. The person that threw 50 probably threw 
70 strikes. Quantity is the biggest thing this whole meta. Actually, I could just make a video in 15 seconds and say if you want to be great at longsword and win longsword duels, you need to throw 70 strikes in 90 seconds, 16 times, and you'll win. I'll give you three great examples. Jonathan McCartney will throw strikes the entire time. They're probably about this fast. He can get a little faster if he wants to for 90 seconds, and you need to be ready for it. That's why you need to train quantity so you can throw just as many as he does. The whole round, he will swing at you. He might step back for a second, but he will come back and he will relentlessly attack you, just like this, right? That is quantity definition number one. Quantity definition, definition number two would be Mickey Gallus. Even if you watch him in that Cincinnati siege, he will come in very fast, throw like six hits and back up half the time he he will stand away from you when he's ahead you know and feeling comfortable probably saving his energy and he'll stand back way out of your range if you come in range he's gonna hit, whack you real quick if you get too close you're gonna catch like a five or six hit combo so there's a quantity definition number two you need to always be ready for someone to throw a six or or more hit combo uh someone else from siege here's the other thing uh, on my team, Chris Saner, will probably do what you do, but he will always hit you in return. Just as fast as you can go, just as long as you can go, but he will hit you. <clears throat> Great example, right? You, you hit him a couple times, he's hitting you about the same amount, you take a step back, he's ready for you. You want to come in, do 10 really quick hits, he's same same thing. He'll wait till you come back and do it again. And he will beat you by just whatever he needs to do. So quantity is the main thing. I'm probably talking about this too much. I could stress quantity all day. I mean, it's probably obvious if you throw three or 80, who's going to win. But I'm hoping I'm opening your eyes up to what top level is these days. <clears throat> 70 strikes in like your 16th round. So you need to be able to continuously throw that many. Or like I said, the other times you need to be able to throw at least five, but up to 10 strikes continuously and be able to take a break and do it again after like five seconds. So quantity is the main thing. We covered the min-maxing armor, which I hope I opened your eyes up to uh, if you're new to this, or you probably knew that anyway if you've been in the sport for a little while, but make sure that's proper fitting. Make sure you're very flexible in it. I even showed you a little exercise uh, suggestion what to look into to increase your range of motion for duels. And then we covered, uh, oh yeah, that, you know, nobody does medieval footwork. And people actually talk crap on Boo Hurt and Armored Combat. They're like, that's not real sword fighting because it's not historical movements. And so what? I mean, who cares? I mean, that's what it is. You don't have to focus on any kind of medieval form, whatever, as long as you're hitting people. And of course, the thing I mentioned at the very beginning is you need to accept a little bit of pain in these duels, right? Because you're getting hit. Just as many times as you hit them, but hopefully you hit them at least one more time or three more times because judges don't always count right, which brings us great into the next segment. So let's just get the judging thing out of the way. You go to a lot of events and judges could be their first time counting. They might not even know exactly what to do. Like, who am I counting points on? Typically, it's, it's judged like this. You're assigned to look at a fighter when you're counting blows you count how many land on them. So this is great just if you never even went to a tournament. If it ever comes up where you need to help out, this is what you need to know. You watch somebody how many times they get hit. Someone else, someone else watches the other person how many times they get hit. At the end, you go compare numbers. Sometimes there might be two counters for each fighter. It's actually a little better because then what you do is they look, and if the numbers are pretty close, they take an average. Numbers are close, they take an average. Sometimes uh, judges can't see because because you're facing this way, you're lined up and they can't really see, you might be scoring, they might not know it. So that's why it's important to actually be winning by more than one point. So judges, uh, at the big events, usually know what they're doing, so you don't really have to worry as much. Other things let's talk about real quick is like the environment, okay? So you wanna get there, you wanna see how big is the list? Is it big, small? You wanna know how much room you're gonna have to move around or if you're gonna get crammed up or you have to stand your ground, right? You want to look at the weather. If it's indoors, great. If it's outdoors, did it rain? Is it wet? Is there mud spots? I encourage people to go on the list and take a couple slides around your shoes 
Make sure it's not too slippy. If it is, you're gonna have to adjust how you walk and things like that. Is it hot? Is it cold? Makes a big difference. Bigger people sometimes get overheated. I get overheated real quick. You know, is it hot outside? It's gonna affect how well you do, how well your opponent does. Things to think about. Um, oh yeah, the, they have a corner man. Big deal, okay? Because you might think you're doing stuff. You get back to your corner, they tell you, hey man, like you not you need to swing. You need to swing a little more, or you got some openings. He's always holding his sword up here, you know, take some lower shots. Their corner man's doing that. They're they're your opponent's eyes in the ring. So you need to have a corner man if possible. It doesn't take much to just ask someone, hey, can you please just be my corner for, for this round? I've done it. I hate to ask people for stuff, but I've done it. Plus, if you have a corner man, it's great because if you have an armor failure or something, you have somebody to try and help you fix it real quick. Nothing like being stuck in the corner and looking for someone like, hey, you got tape with your helmet on, no one can hear you. And, and then you have to forfeit the match because your armor, your pauldron ripped off and no one was there to help you tape it. Corner man, big thing as far as strategy. Lots of us don't even listen to our corner man, but at least you have somebody there to see a third person view of you fighting or your opponent. Something else about the environment, which isn't related to being actually there. Like, did you get enough sleep? Did you prepare? Did you hydrate enough, right? Stuff like that. Did you sleep enough? I can't fight if I haven't slept enough. Is it a.m. or p.m.? I'm a night owl. I hate getting armor on at like 8 a.m. to fight at 10. You're probably going to have a better chance of beating me at 10 a.m. than you do at like 7 p.m. 7 p.m., I'm ready for anything. 10 a.m., you know, I'm, I'm just getting stretched out for the day. You know, things like that. Consider. Another thing, uh, what's your duel order? Look at the schedule. If you can, if you can find out when you're fighting, please do. You want to know the rounds. Are you fighting the first round, fifth round, ninth round? And then the finals, if you get there, because you followed my meta, <laughs> or are you fighting like first round, third round, fifth round, where it's scrunched together, you don't have as much time to rest, you know? So you gotta think of things like this, so you're prepared, that you know you're going right back in, things like that. And it's not just being endurance and cardio and stuff like that, you gotta be able to have some mind control, so when you're resting there, even in the corner between rounds, or if you're just sitting there and you're waiting, and you're able to get your heart rate down, get your heart rate down, get your breathing under control. Practice things to help your, your body calm down. I've monitored my pulse. It's been up to 170 while I've been fighting in armor. Go to the corner, it's still like 130. You need to get that down so your body can rest. It gets it helps your body just transport oxygen, gets rid of all the, the lactic acid, you know, all the waste products from you fighting. Just make sure you're able to learn how to properly recover between very high rounds of intense dueling, okay? So let's go into something really cool. We're gonna learn how to assess our opponent, okay? You've never met him before, maybe you did. People have reputations. Reputation means they got film footage online somewhere probably. Check out Instagram, Facebook, even search the internet. Try and find these people and what they do. You'll see how good they are, especially experienced people with a big reputation that you know by name just before you even see them in real life. Find out how they fight. It'll really help you prepare for your duel. Experience is a big thing, right? You're gonna assess your opponent. Probably experience is the main thing. Experience can override all kinds of things, like what kind of armor they wear, um, you know, stuff like that. An experienced person who's been fighting in that same suit of armor for years can probably really fight in it. Like, great example out here in Pittsburgh, Daniel Stuhl, one of the best swordsmen I know, and he wears uh, like full plate with kind of limited vision and he's such an expert and he will beat you in a very pretty heavy duty suit of armor because he knows what he's doing. On the other hand, someone with a whole lot less experience or even new and they're fighting for the first time and, and they have their like a big heavy suit of armor or melee kit on, they, they're probably gonna get tired out. They might come out swinging a lot the first round, second round might only be half that. They might not even be able to survive the third round. <laughs> so experience plays a big part as far as what you expect. Very experienced people will also do things to try and bait you into attacks. They may hold their sword a certain way so that you think, oh, I got this big wide opening. You go for an opening and do that, that quick double tap or a triple tap. So while you hit them once, they hit you like two or three times. I love baiting people with a low guard. Newer people, I do it all the time. I hold my sword low, they think I'm open at my head and as they swing, I do the little windshield wiper motion and I actually don't even hit them. I'm aiming for their blade so I can come around and I can hit them in the head. 
knock their blade out of the way. It's a great opening. I'll go over that whenever I get to my my strategy and how I fight. Now, here's the best thing when you fight people who have little experience. If you watch this video, maybe you'll learn not to do these kinds of things. People with not a lot of experience put a sword in their hand. They go out there. They might forget to swing. People with not a lot of experience will, will like usually just walk up into you. And they're just like, a lot of times these are people getting the clinches and things all the time. Because they're just like, they don't know how to judge a range and they're just getting too close. They might just be walking with you, with you like this and you're hitting them and they might hit like once or twice because they just don't have the experience. Assess, assessing your opponent is, as far as their experience. Probably the most important thing is if you can find footage on them beforehand, do so. And if they're very experienced, watch out that you don't get baited into any stupid attacks where you might think that their, their ribs are open, you hit them, but then they hit you two times, so they're winning. And then for the new people, watch for the ones that don't remember to swing and just follow you around and you can pick them apart. And if you're new, don't do that. Don't be the one following someone around. Remember you got a sword and to use it. And if and the ones that are also new, the easiest ones are ones that come out swinging like a hundred times. And then the second round, they're so spent they can't even swing 15. So that's probably what I'd say the biggest things about experience are when you're assessing your opponent. The next most important thing is body type. Bigger, heavier. This is like meant to, no offense to anybody. Bigger, heavier equals slower, uh, use more energy. More heat expenditure, like I said. Is it hot outside? They're probably going to burn down. Uh, bigger, um, they're going to have, but they're also going to have a longer range. And they're also going to have probably more power. So a taller person is probably going to whack you a little bit harder from farther away. You're fighting someone who's smaller, shorter, skinnier. These are people that you can sort of bully around a little bit sometimes. Because in this stuff, there's, there's no weight classes most of the time, unless you're doing a pro fight. They're going to be ones that are going to be a little, a little bit faster, probably. They're going to be harder to, to try and knit, cut off their escape routes from you if you're being aggressive. These people also probably have a, a better angle on you than you do on them, believe it or not, when, you get, when things get close and you're close together. So let's break down the ideal scenario if you're bigger and taller and less mobile and uh, you're finding someone who's smaller and skinnier. Just keep in mind, there's different rules for different leagues. <clears throat> One league will let you pummel somebody. Okay, you're fighting someone who's smaller. You're a lot bigger, less mobile. Use your reach, use your power. Some leagues will let you use a one-handed swing. Super far reach on that, right? You already got the reach advantage. Keep smaller, shorter people away from you, right? Your worst enemy if you're taller against someone shorter, is them getting in your range. If they get too close and they're right here, you don't have anything to swing. Your, your sword is like limited, limited to here, right? Keep them away. Every time they try to come in, you need to punish them on their way in at least. If they get closer, you need to, because you're bigger, if you're in a clinch, push them back. Every time you push somebody from a clinch, you strike. But if they're smaller than you, you can bully them a little bit. If you're in a clinch, you can push them back. There's nothing illegal about pushing somebody like, like this, right? When you're in a clinch. If you're in a league that lets you pummel and someone shorter than you is like right in here, top of the head immediately. If they get in too close, this is when you use your pummel and you punish them for getting too close. Taller people, don't chase shorter people so much that you get too close and you ruin your range advantage. That's my biggest, my biggest tip. So many times these bigger guys come in and they get so close and then they can't do anything with their sword because they're too close. Now, if you're shorter, uh, I have a, a great tip for you here. First of all, like I said, you have to be able to overcome that fear of getting hit because you need to close the range. So like I just said with someone taller, if you're shorter by a good bit, you need to get inside the range to make their sword, the use of their sword, ineffective. And you're probably going to take a hit on the way in. If you're good, you might be able to block it on the way in. So, not every league's the same. Sometimes it's like from like the hips, up, the torso and head and arms are worth two points and the legs are worth one. Sometimes it's equal. It's a point no matter what. Here's what you do. Short person, if the taller person, which will let them do, comes at you to bully you, 
you need to be able to retreat a little bit enough where you can hit them, and I would say low. So if a tall person is cramping, cramping on your style, and you're short, leg, 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 and make it count, leg, ribs. Don't just hit, keep hitting the legs or the marshal might just stop it. Leg, ribs. You have a whole side of a tall person open. They might be pummeling you on your helmet, but that's why you have a nice helmet so that they might score a couple points, but as they're going like this, you're probably just getting easy amount of points in return. Shorter people never get pinned in the corner, always have an escape route, know how big the list is. Like I said, remember, check your environment because if someone's bullying you, you need to be able to get out so you don't get trapped on the list or in a corner. A lot of people might think that a very tall person has the advantage, but here's the thing. If a small person can get in enough range where they're in their striking range, that whole person is a target. I wouldn't come exactly overhead because that's probably where their sword is, but any kind of overhead, you're hitting their forearms, forearms. You know, you got their forearms. You got much more access to the ribs. A tall person cannot put their guard, their cross guard, all the way down here to block their hips. You got open hip shots, hip shots. A, I believe a shorter person has such a big advantage on a uh, taller person if they can uh, manage to get inside to, to be in their striking range. If a shorter person is able to hit you in their striking range, the bigger person is already a disadvantage. So remember, big tall person, use your reach, use your power. You can push what's allowed within the rules and bully these shorter people. If they get too close, it's pummel time. Uh, don't get so over over confident that you get too close to them and then they're inside your range and you did them a favor. Shorter people are gonna have to pay the price, the pain, price of pain, and you're gonna have to get inside the range. You're gonna have to take a hit or you're gonna have to be able to block it on your way in. You close the range on a tall person, everything probably from here down is a target. This is two points in here. Two points or leg, leg. After body type, the next most important thing to assess is their armor type. Is this person wearing what they fight in melee with? It makes a big difference on how much they can move, how heavy it is. Is it full plate? When I see someone in full plate, I'm usually like, thank God I'm fighting them. Surprise, it's not because it's heavier. A lot of times like a, a full steel curious is actually lighter than a, uh, like a wool steel brig, believe it or not. Not always, but it can be. It's not a thing of how heavy it is for me when I see that. It's just I know they're probably not as flexible and, and no, might not have such a big range of motion. You see somebody with, you see somebody in a melee kit, heavier armor, I would suggest you circle. You don't just square up face to face. You want to swing and be going around them this way to make them have to swing farther. This person wearing an Eastern kit, I think that they're generally more mobile. Someone in the Eastern kit has a... Uh, probably a little bit better range of motion because of just how the shoulders are, the plates, how they are, a little bit more flexible. So Eastern kits, you know, a lot of people wear Eastern kits and they're pretty good. If you watch a lot of the overseas videos like Battle Nations and stuff, you'll see a lot of people in Eastern kits do rather well. So so tell you what, let's go, to, uh, go over to the Pell now. We'll get on to that part of the video. I'm going to show you some things on with these different uh, limitations armor can give you or body types. And we'll sh I'll give you some tips on how I think you can fight better and uh, how to deal with some people depending on height differences. And we'll see what these things look like in real life. Now that we're back here over at the Pell for a little bit, the first thing I really want to do is share with you my form. Now this isn't something based off some historical manuscript or whatever, any kind of thing like that. This is just over the years how I've developed this stance because this is how I feel the most comfortable fighting. If there's anything that you like about it, feel free to imitate. I'd love to run into like a mirror match out there of myself one day. So here's a little picture in the bottom corner to show you exactly what it looked like. And these pictures are like years apart now. So I'm almost always fighting in this stance. So if you notice, left leg forward, right? So left leg forward, what I've done is I've removed my head from the battle. I have plenty of room and space in front of my head to throw blows, right? So I have more room in front of me than they usually do to maneuver my sword. Another thing I like about this is, say that um, I go to hit them and they go to hit me, a lot of times I can duck back. I'd say I probably have like a 50-50 eh, percentage success rate. So if we're just trading blows, I just move that left leg back. Or if I see it coming through here, I might just be able to lower my sword and go like that. 
there's plenty of pictures I've seen of myself going like that. I'm actually pretty certain that it's, it's a, a known fact that if your right foot is forward, it's considered an offensive position because if you're fighting with a long sword, right-handed, and your right foot is forward, you're more like up front, offensive position, compared to if your left leg is forward, just the, by position of your body and where your hands and sword are and how it's gonna move, it's more of a defensive position. Another reason I like my left foot forward is because I take less hits to the groin. You know how many times I've got hit there in my life from sword fighting? I feel a lot more comfortable with my left leg forward so when they're hitting me a right-hander, it's gonna hit the outside of my left thigh instead of with my right foot forward and it's a pretty wide open groin shot. Obviously groin shots are not allowed, but accidents happen. Left foot forward, head is back. Most of my weight is on my right leg. There's not as much on the left. Now what am I doing below the waist? Do you see what I'm doing here? Straight left leg, straight right leg. Straight left leg, straight right leg. Now this is basically my, how I generate my power. There might be some kind of real way you're supposed to move your hips or do things like that in sword fighting. This is my thing, right? So I have a, a pretty extensive ballroom dancing history background. I competed in Latin International. And I found that Samba translates into sword fighting very well. So whenever I'm doing things in like in dance, my hips are moving depending on like straightening and bending knees. That's how I'm getting hip rotation. And also, of course, you know, where your weight is at the time. So I just developed this natural feel, sort of out of dance, on how I get my hip rotation. I'll have to turn this vertical so you can see what I mean. Straight left leg. Right leg. Left leg. Right leg. See how much twist that gives me just if I'm not even moving my arms. So it gets me some, some torso rotation. So it puts some extra power into those hits. And the thing is it helps me turn my body. So when it's combo time or if I'm like standing my ground to do like a eight, 10 hit combo or if I have to stand there and swing in place for like 15, 20 seconds, it's a great rhythm for me to get into where I'm not even really thinking about anything. It's just a rhythm. I practice it so much that it, it's become pretty quick and I think I have some pretty powerful strikes out of it. So now that's for like any duel I could do. Now let me show you about something for HMB, right? So in HMB, I don't have to worry about someone like kicking me or really knocking me off balance, right? Remember what we said earlier about how you don't even really need a lot of historical form and, and hits like this are counted as points, right? So HMB, a lot of times if I score up with somebody, I'm just going back and forth like this, right? Watch. Bend the left knee. Look how little I move my sword. Bend the right knee. Left knee. Right knee. Left knee. Right knee. It gives me, it, I drop down, it gives me that extra little bit of power from dropping my weight behind it. It's very easy, doesn't use a whole lot of energy. All I'm doing is one, two, one, two. Straighten the leg, straighten the other leg. You know, bend the knee, bend the knee. Those work so well for me if I have to just stand my ground or if I'm standing in place, throwing a lot of hits. Now, obviously you're not always doing that. So if we're in a sword fight and, and we're fighting and fighting and fighting and it starts moving, right? I would rather them come to me because I can control the range so much easier. I will be aggressive if someone lets me be aggressive as long as I can control the range. So if someone is coming towards me, right? This is why I like to back up. For one, they're moving forward, so most of their weight is gonna be 
coming towards me. Usually head is going to be an easier target or like their forearms or things like that while they're coming at me and I'm moving backwards at the same time. Okay. Another thing is it's a lot easier for me to control the range where if they're walking towards me, if I'm walking backwards, I can stay as far away from them as I want. If I get tired or if they're actually like hitting me a lot somehow, I can always stop and they'll just run right into me into like a clinch or something. Every time you separate from a clinch, you throw a strike, right? In general though, I control the range because I'm walking backwards. I can walk backwards all day. I can walk backwards as fast as you can walk towards me. That's why it's important to know the list size. Like we said earlier, know your environment. I know exactly where it is so I never get pinned in the corner, right? Always walking backwards. I'm the one initiating when the clinch happens. Compared to if I'm following somebody and they stop, oh geez, I'm like already in a clinch already, right? Unexpected, I like to be able to control things. I like to expect what's gonna happen. If I walk backwards, I can keep them right where I want. If I need to get, if they're really swinging, if they're taller than me, and I'm walking backwards, I can control my range. I can hit from like out here, right? If I need to go a little bit closer, I walk a little bit slower. Now I can like really whack and, and do all these crazy things in here. A lot easier than if I'm following them, then they're controlling where, where we stop, how far the range is. Then I might have to adjust and get back outside. If I'm walking backwards, I control how close we are. So like I said a second ago, and I can't stress this enough, if you learn anything from this video, clinches, you always throw a strike when you separate from a clinch. Your hands are all tied up here. You step back, throw a strike. Your hands are up here. You're, you push them, strike. Your hands are up here. They push you. I don't care, you just throw a strike. Anytime you separate from somebody, throw a strike. If you can see, I'm not really coming straight down because that's where their sword is. When I throw, a, if I step back, I actually go on an angle and I strike like that. The sword's right here. Which brings me to another thing. If you learned anything in this video today about practicing at home or wherever, you need to learn this, like if you're new, right? Even if you're not new, because people still uh, are guilty of this. Training on the Pell is great all day, right? Woohoo, woohoo, woohoo. All right, you're hitting a pal, you're hitting a pal. It is important to also practice like a shadow boxing kind of thing, right? Shadow sword fighting, right? <laughs> never, try to never go like this. Take a break from hitting your pal because you're trying to hit through it. You're trying to cut all the way down to the ground, right? You almost never miss your pal. Go, go uh, shadow sword fight and see what happens. Do you go like this? Well, oh, I heard some I heard some wind on that. Do you go like this? That's a big no-no. Look. If you miss, and your sword's down here, this whole thing is a target. My whole body. People who are playing around with swords going like this, horrible practice. Here, here, here. It is no difference on here. Look how hard I'm hitting it. And if he wasn't there, <laughs> you know what I mean? If you miss, Oh gosh, wide open target compared to if I miss. Ooh. Remember, we're not allowed to stab, so you can't stop like this with your point at somebody. This isn't pointed at them. I got my sword right in the center here. If I'm if I miss, they throw a shot. I can hopefully block it or something, right? Mm. If you learned something else today, <laughs> a 
we're on a roll now. <sighs> All right. You ever see people stand like this? If you see it and their sword is right here, smack them on top of the head. The proper height is actually going to be above your head. That blocks it coming down, not this. I can hit your head right here. Totally horrible thing to do is to get in the habit of holding your sword in front of you like this. Or someone can hit you on top of the head. Three top tier tips I'm giving you right now. Do not forget any of these. You exit a clinch, you always throw a strike. You practice on your pel all day long like this. Shadow box to make sure you're not going like this and becoming a wide open target. <clears throat> and to expand on that tip, if you're having trouble like this, you're like, oh, I'm always down here. <sighs> Keep your elbows a little closer to your body. It'll naturally stop. See, you'll bottom out on your body. And then the number three thing is, if anyone is ever holding, don't ever hold your guard this low, but if you ever see someone doing that, instant headshot. All right, everybody, I'm about to share my biggest long sword secret ever. Call me a gatekeeper, if you will, but I've never shared it before because I don't want other people doing it. All right, but now you can too. So anytime anyone's like, oh, like you're so good at longsword, you know, the things you do are really cool, like that helicopter. This is the secret to the helicopter. If you've done HEMA before, like German longsword, you probably already know. So the helicopter that I guess I've become famous for is this, right? The back and forth. Jesus. I forgot I moved this thing closer and I just hit the chandelier. <laughs> Nothing broke. All right. But you get the idea, right? And how effortlessly I do it. <laughs> Woo. All right. So, yeah, I have plenty of room when this thing's back there, but I moved it closer. Ah, see, that's what I get. That's like my karma for never sharing my secret till now. The whole key is this. When we're sword fighting, we're like this. Bah, bah, bah. When you go to the helicopter, you put your thumb on a blade and you're turning your sword sideways. So look, my thumb is totally protected from anyone striking straight at me. However, it is on a blade. And however, however, I do have like an enclosed thumb here. So if someone hits me, see so I even have a dent right there. If a sword would slide down behind here, just be warned that it can nick the bottom of your thumb. You gotta get this fast. This is what you practice at home. Okay? Because you need to do it very fast to be able to get into this and out. You will usually see me getting ready because I suddenly have my sword this way. Look, if I cannot hit the chandelier, look how easy this is with one hand to keep the blade totally on edge. This is also another good suggestion for lining up shots. And I have to share this because it's gonna play into the next two things I'm gonna show you. Thumbing the blade. As soon as you're done, right? I do a, wow, oh, helicopter. I usually do this to people once they get very tired to rack up points. And as soon as I'm done, So this is a hamster cage, by the way, and look who's coming out to play. One of the smallest hamsters you'll ever see. If I'm being circled and you're going to my left side, so this is like where I'm right-handed, so you're going this way. I have to swing that much farther. I can, of course, keep turning in a circle, but still, I have to go this much farther to hit you. If you circle to my sword side, to my right side, I just have to do this. And I'm gonna hit you, okay? Almost never circle to someone's sword side. Circle to their left side, their open side. 
That means they have to go this much farther to hit you. Even if they have to turn their feet, there's still more distance they have to cover. So when I'm circling and I'm not thumbing the blade, it's opposite of what I said. Remember earlier I said about the HMB thing where bend the left knee, bend the right knee, bend the left knee, because see how that actually helps bring my sword across their center line, right? But when I'm gonna circle somebody, I actually do opposite. So instead of going like this, I actually go like this. This is what it looks like. So I stepped off to the side. See, my sword is here. This is a, this is the side they're gonna be swinging at me on. So if I'm moving this way, I'm ducking to the side and I'm hitting here. Bring the sword up like that. Now, if I'm going to do it thumbing the blade, I actually step, uh, it's, it's a different step. Because this time, I want to keep the sword up here, right? So I'm actually stepping a little bit different. It's the opposite foot for the opposite side of the head. Just watch, you'll see what I mean. Step, step, step. All right, so did you catch that? Thumbing the blade, stepping to the left foot, the right side of the head. And my sword is up here to try and, try and shield me from them hitting me. If I'm not thumbing the blade, duck to the right, left. Duck to the right, but my right knee is bending to move that way. Now, I mean, that's just what I do. Take it for how you want. I hope at least it inspires you to play around. The more you just fight right here on the center line, you know, it's great and all, but there's a lot of advantages to be able to go all of a sudden and be like offside. Especially somebody with like, remember we talked about limited vision, just to change the pace of things, make it a little bit harder for them to hit you because you're no longer right in front of them. Now they gotta go like this and they gotta react. So doing things to try and get off, off the center line is always a good idea. Boop, boop, bow, change, bow. We talked about taller and shorter earlier, right? Just pretend now that I'm taller and this person is a lot shorter than me. These are my strikes. If I'm taller, this is all I'm worried about. Either straight downs or like collarbone, shoulder, collarbone, shoulder. You can aim down here. But here's the thing, they're a lot shorter, you're really going to be aiming down here, okay? So, three strikes. There's nothing wrong with only concentrating on three strikes. You can, by all means, try to do other things, go for the leg and stuff like that. But, your bread and butter are just three strikes right here. Now, if I'm shorter... And someone's like much taller. This is a little exaggerated, of course. Remember how I said rib, ribs, ribs, right? This person's arms, this is about their sword level. They can probably bring it down to about here. They're not going to uh, be able to block all these shots here. If you're really crammed up on somebody and you're shorter, remember I said leg. You can even stand a little sideways. I'm twisting it. I'm twisting my torso. This is all I'm doing. Ribs down here. If the shorter person comes towards you, I'm taller now. Remember, they're shorter. If they get in here like this, pommel, pommel, pommel. If the rules allow for it. Otherwise. It's clinch and push them away. Remember, every time you exit a clinch, you strike. If you're shorter <laughs> and they're trying to clinch with you, duck down. These are your bread and butter shots right here. If you're shorter, feel free. Remember I said their whole body's a target. You're hitting up here. 
This is you're probably hitting their forearms and all kinds of other things. Shorter people, I feel, have the biggest advantage when it's tall versus shorter. The thing we talked about earlier with experienced people trying to bait you into things, right? Say I'm really experienced and I'm up like this. Where are you going to hit me? This could be a target. But for people who are less experienced, this is what they're looking at. I stand like this. They swing down here. They swing at the ribs. Head. You can probably double tap them. By the time they go like this, ribs, they have to come all the way back up here. All you have to do is this. All right, you thumbing the bladers. Here is my classic opening move, explained in depth. I could not do it before because I didn't want to give it away. So, if I'm thumbing the blade and I'm holding my sword low, it is because my hand, which I keep on the pommel, is just ready for when they swing that I'm baiting at my head. It's up like this, into their sword, then into the head. You can do that. It's much easier thumbing the blade than trying to hold your sword like this. For one, the edge isn't even on, on the line. Coming up like this and, and like this or something. I don't even know how you do it if you don't thumb the blade. My opening guard for almost every duel until someone doesn't swing at me for a couple seconds is put my thumb right here behind it you come up i usually even have it here you tap swords we go the round starts i'm holding actually like down here but so you can see it on the camera i'm not aiming at them i'm aiming at their sword i just wait and wait as soon as they swing at my head coming down this way coming right you hear the wind? This wrist stays here. The bottom one here whips it around so hard it bashes their sword out of the way. And while it's out of the way, I come up and it's that thumbing the blade helicopter move. Bah! Into the head. It's such a cool opener. And it's a total bait. If I stand around like this for like five or six seconds and nobody takes it, then I usually just go back to this. Really cool opener. But the point is, you don't always have to attack them. If they're waving their sword around here like this, there's nothing at all wrong with whacking it down. Boy, if you really hit it and you whack them down, that whack their sword out of the way that far, come up, bow. Knock their sword out of the center. You, their head is totally wide open. Boo Hurt League allows you to do this. One hand. If you're very tall, you have quite a reach with one hand. I mean, I'm standing way out here. Don't forget to look at the rule books. Boo hurt like HMB. Fingers are targets. IMCF, they're not. If you're fighting HMB, someone's holding their sword out there. Hand. Fingers. All day. IMCF, different story. But, don't forget, in HMB, I can do this. One handed shots are allowed. I would suggest you're really only doing it with like these range shots like this. It's sort of pointless to walk up to somebody and hit them like that. But don't forget you can use one-handed shots. If you find yourself being stuck in a corner up against a rail, you're just getting hit so many times you don't know how to deal with it, you can always run away, turn around, ready to go. 
Nothing wrong with running away. I'm hitting this guy, right? Runs away. I might get one hit in his back. I might totally miss. Remember the shadow boxing? I might really miss. But either way, I'm hitting my target. I know he's there. They just turned and ran away. Oh. Now he's like 15 feet away and squared off again, ready to go. It's like resetting. Never be afraid to run away if it can create uh, an advantage. Either get you out of something you're getting beat on, uh, you're cornered, run away. But don't forget, as soon as you turn around, be on guard and be ready to go. We talked earlier about restrictive armor, you know, and people who can only do stuff or put their hands up this high or just run out of energy really quick. Okay. So now we're going to talk about that. So if this is you and this is all the range of motion you got, you know what? That's fine. That is what you're going to do. <clears throat> Saving energy. He's right here. I'm throwing, I'm throwing strikes. If he's not anywhere in my range, I'm not in guard. I'm just standing here. It takes almost nothing to bring my sword up. If you're not in range, even if you have great armor, when you're resting, if you're stepping away, if you're not engaged, just relaxing. Your sword can be like this, it can be down, whatever. You are not standing like this or like this, unless you have godlike endurance and you can do it all day long. This is a waste of energy when they're over there for 10 seconds. This is not a waste of energy. If you have limited mobility or endurance problems, you need all the energy you can get. They get close, swords up. They get in range, Remember the things I showed you earlier? Okay, this is all the range of motion I got, right? Bend knee. Bend both knees. Bend both knees just a little bit. These count as strikes. And you will train at home. You will train in your limited range of motion armor this. You want to be able to do this for a whole round. You want to be able to do this for another whole round. You want to be able to at least try and turn your wrists a little bit to get some kind of angle like that. And if you can't, you do the thing, like I said, about straightening a leg, straightening the other leg, straightening the other leg. You might even try to do this. But if you're very slow and you have limited range of motion, they're probably going to hit you on the head a couple times. But if you're just trying to have some fun, this is not very much different than this. And all I'm doing is twisting my core. I can't get my arms up above here. I don't care what you do, even if you have to bend over like this. You can do it. <laughs> the point is to have fun. If you sign up for a longsword duel, it's because you like it. Because you want to be good at it. You can totally f feel fine only having a couple moves. My range of motion now is really horrible because I have horrible range of motion in my armor. So I'm using my body. Torso. 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 Look, my sword almost doesn't even have to, I don't even have to move my arms. Saving energy. When I throw strikes, my hands are almost like this until about the end. Inside my gauntlets, this is exaggerated. I'm not always gripping it so hard that my forearms get worn out. Pretty loose. Don't want to drop the sword. Want to have a nice solid grip when it connects. You don't want to be so loose that it slips out of your hand or something. You don't have to have a death grip on your sword the whole time. You can so much get under somebody like that. 
And especially for people out here who are, who are the shorter ones, these are great strikes because for one, when you finish, your sword is almost, remember what I said, up above your head. Not here, where you get hit on top of the head, but here. I'm, I'm shorter, I can come up like this, right under the armpit. If I'm taller, there's no point in doing it. If we're about the same height, you're taller, and I said, how much of a disadvantage it is. I take that back because I these are things I do and this can help you if you're taller and you have the range of motion. So check this out, right? Or even if we're like the same height, okay? And you wanna get low on somebody. Remember I just said that these things can help you get a little bit lower. A lot of times these leave your head wide open, right? Which they do. You can Squat down. See now, if I'm hitting in the ribs, my sword is actually up here. Okay. If you feel like you're just getting all jammed up up here, right? I often will duck down and I'll throw a couple down here. So when you train on your pel, duck like you're sitting down. If you're taller and you're having some trouble on someone who's a little bit shorter, you, you have a wide stance or whatever keeps you balanced, you bend both your knees. I do that all the time. Not for very long because it can be tiring on, especially on these big leg muscles like your quads. But I often will dip down to do like maybe three or four hits low. It helps me so much get down underneath and also, my sword is a little bit higher, so if they do swing at me, it's already here. In an exchange, if you want to try and block some of those hits, this is how you're going to throw your shots. Right? We've already been talking about this all day long. You know, this way, right? Well, when I'm doing this, they can hit me here. I switch to the other side. They hit me here. It's like even. I go like that, they hit me here. I try and swing another one there. They can still hit me here. If you throw shots like this and go into a guard afterwards into your next shot, you may very well block some of those strikes they throw back at you. If I hit someone like this, I bring my sword up like this, so it's above my head so I don't get hit, and bring my sword around this way and come down like that. Up. Up. You have to have good range of motion. But see how I'm blocking my head. Now, it is slower than someone just going like this. Because you are going like this. And I will tell you from experience, sometimes when you go like this, and you go to bring it up, you get your sword stuck on them. They might move a little bit a little bit closer to you. See? And now your sword's stuck over here, and you get hit. <clears throat> I tend to prefer actually throwing swords with a little bit of protection like this. Because I can get my arms up that high. However, like I said, you have to watch that you don't just leave it there and go up where your swords can get stuck. You have to go like this and bring it back and up. Dirty trick I had used against me more than once. You're up close fighting with somebody. They step in. They put an arm here and hold my sword down and they take with their other hand and give me some one-handed shots. If you're close to somebody, this hand goes over both of theirs. Leg, leg, 
way. My only solution, if you can't just run, get out of the way, is to go up and you stand just like this. Marshall will say, hey, break. They should at least. The ACW still allows half sorting. Pummel, pummel. It's so obvious. However, I always liked to do these too. Like a one, two. If you can get in there and when they have their hands up, you drop it down, chest. <laughs> it can really shock somebody. Chest. That is one thing why I like in the ACW. They still allow, allow half sorting. Do it all the time. Not all the time. Less than I used to. Pop. Pop. The battering ram. Right here. Also with half sorting. Almost like this. How they get their hand down there. If you can get in here. So their sword is here. Coming through here, right? These all count as points. Blade to face. Blade to chest. Blade to face. The only way I've had people counter that is by getting up to me like this. So now I'm like this. And I can't do it. If someone ever gets you in that half sorting position, they're hitting you. Smother them. If the rules allow kicks, you follow up a kick with a strike. Kick, strike. Kick, strike. You may kick them so hard they fall down or get out of your range. Kick, strike. Same as that clinch. Break the clinch. You always have an exit plan, and your exit plan is that. Now it's time to talk psychology, mind tricks. Great story. Uh, <laughs> I've done this plenty of times. I will be sitting in the corner. The round ends. I'm laying up on the rail. <sighs> Remember, trying to get... Like we talked about earlier, resting between rounds, trying to get my heart rate down. I'm thinking like I'm, I'm holding like my girl's hand. We're walking through a field. It's a nice sunny day. Like we're going to a picnic. No joke. I've thought of stuff like this, right? Ah, you know, it's so calming. Yeah, you know. Ah, but I'm still super tired. So is my opponent. They're in the corner. If their back's towards me, right, I pay attention to this because what I will do, I'll wait for the ref to say like 10 seconds. As soon as I hear 10 seconds, if their back is still tor turned towards me, I walk out. I stand just like this with both hands on top of the pummel, standing up straight, staring right at them. So they turn around. They're like, man, we, we were both probably so worn out. You know, they turn around out of the corner like this. And they, and they see me stand here like this, ready to go. Total mind game. I could be even still be in my helmet like... <laughs> but they don't know it. All they see is this. Fighter ready. Now, would you be scared of something like that? Or would you be more scared if I was still out of breath and they're like, fighter ready. And I turn around like this. <laughs> mind games. How many times have you been, you had a thought in your mind or you're in the middle of a story and someone interrupts you all, all of a sudden is like, hey, hey, uh, did you get that 20 bucks I owe you? I mailed, I emailed it to you in, in your PayPal or something and inter interrupts you. You're like, uh, um, yeah, yeah, I got, like, what the heck was I talking about? Same thing with sword fighting. This is what, this is a sword fighting conversation, right? 
someone knows, all right, I'm about to hit this guy. They're like, I'm going to set up like a three hit combo. I'm going to go in for it like, like right now. And they, as they start to bring their sword up, you do this. You can't see as well. They're about to take that swing, lift a leg, the other one. Even if you're not allowed to kick, there's nothing that says you can't go like this or bring a leg up, okay? A lot of times I'll do a stomp. Someone will be about to, <laughs> someone will be about to, about to swing and I might go like this. I move my feet around sometimes, do awkward things. Things like this, right? If someone's about to swing at me, if you're about to swing at me and I go like this, or, or this, a knee, or a, a fake, might you forget what you're about to do for a second, your three hit combo. There's a specific psychological term for this, but you, you interrupt someone's thought process. They're about to do something, but you interrupt it by doing something like that as well especially against newer inexperienced people new person doesn't even have to be a new person just your opponent right pretend you're gonna throw a strike to the head did they try to block their head did they just did they just stand there if they just stood there, you probably would have landed it. If you go like that, what do they do? Do they go like this? Do it again. Huh? Well, next time you go like this. You act like you're going to hit him in the head. Arms go up. Hit him there. Throw to the side. Just pretend you're going to. You don't do it. You see what they do. Do they turn like they're going to intercept it? Do they just stand there? You learn a lot about what people do. They will, they will reveal to you how they're going to react to your strike if you fake it. Okay. Psychological games. That is my little bag of tricks for longsword dueling. Some things I could think of over the last couple days when I was preparing to make this video of what can I share that I do in longsword duels that you might also like to know about and try for yourself if you don't already. Obviously, you won't use all those tricks in every single duel, but if you practice them, there will be times, I promise you, that arise when you think, oh yeah, I remember that from a video, and it'll just click in your head and make sense, and you'll do it, and it'll work out for you. So let's see, I will, uh, I'll go over the, the couple things I always do, a lot out of those tricks, just to show you, like, real quick, and then I'm going to talk about, how about we'll explain what goes through my mind for my optimal plan that I try to stick to for every duel and then we'll wrap up the video all right so I will start my form that I always do for years has been this one where you're coming down bringing it up and coming down the other way so at least if I do this and we're exchanging I have that chance to stop someone from attacking me at the same time right Probably something I do in almost every single duel when, it's, when there's multiple huge quantities of strikes being thrown is that, that height change I showed you. Whenever you're coming around and like this and to hit low instead of like that, a lot of times I will bend my knees and come around like this for two or three before I get up and start hitting up here again. My actual, actual main reason is because I feel like I can hit on edge better instead of bringing my sword down like this, where I might spatula it. If I actually drop down and just throw a normal strike, as I would if I was standing straight up in the air, I feel like I have better, I land uh, on the edge better that way. Like I said, anytime you're in a clinch, you separate, you always throw. If you learned anything in this video, remember that. So many people just leave a clinch and then they get hit. We got my world famous opening. Remember when you're thumbing the blade? Or I might even do this in the middle of a duel if they see me holding my sword down. I'm usually waiting for someone. I'm baiting them to strike in my head so I can do that windshield wiper motion and come around 
and strike the head. <clears throat> a lot of times if someone's just holding a sword out here, I'll just do it. See what happens. I may also sometimes try and hit their sword down like that. For It, it can create a great opening. Uh, that's usually for these slow-paced duels or in the beginning when you're just standing around, nothing's really going on. Slow-paced duels where you're fighting somebody and you're not going to throw more than 20 strikes in a round. Oh, and of course, when someone gets tired while we're talking about thumbing the blade, or sometimes I do this while I'm chasing somebody down, just these, you know. <laughs> I often will chase people and do that. And I do it in step, so I'm like, I rarely try and fight someone straight ahead like this the whole time. I, like I said, I'm usually retreating and I'm usually trying to retreat on a curve. And if I can, I find somebody that I can take advantage of. Of course I do, like I was saying about circling around people. And I went through all that trouble to show you the two different ways that I step when I do that. But like I said in the beginning of the video, if you're gonna circle somebody, it doesn't matter if you're doing that or you're just walking. Like I'm just walking now, I'm going around somebody you know, <laughs> what I say in the beginning, footwork doesn't matter. But then I showed you the, my preferred steps when I'm circling. And think about this too. Every step is a swing. That's why I have specific uh, steps I do when I do certain things. Because every time my form comes from my feet. So if I'm moving, even if I'm standing still, that, that shift in my weight or a step, you know, Every time I'm swinging a sword, my foot is moving or my weight is changing. All right, so here is my perfect strategy for a duel, whether it's 60 seconds, 90 seconds, okay? Like I said, the meta for longsword is quantity above all else. You don't want to have to throw 70 strikes, but you need to be able to throw as many strikes as possible for an entire round. You need to be able to throw as quick as you can combos you need to be able to throw quantities of combos and at least five to six hits in a combo. We're about to duel. You come up, usually the marshal will have you start in the center. Sometimes they'll have you start in your corners. Generally though, you'll touch swords to start the duel. Duel starts. I'm standing left foot forward. I try to start on their side. If we're coming out from each corner to meet, I usually rush up. So I'm starting so that the halfway point is behind me. So I'm, on, I'm starting on their side of the list. That means I have more room to maneuver. Like I said, I will walk backwards almost the entire time. I might take a shot. I might take another shot. No one wants to fight. I, I wanna fight you, but I only want you to, I re really only wanna fight you for like about 10, 15 seconds of true exchanges, so. I try and take it slow. If someone will keep that pace with me, I will do that all day long and I will try and score points. As long as I know I'm ahead, I'm walking backwards and I'm defending myself. If I feel like I'm behind in points, that's when I usually start with small combos where we might get in one where it's a an exchange like this. No, oh, clinch, throw. And I just try and get ahead in some small exchanges. You can tell you're walking back. If I feel I'm getting beat very badly in points, I will go for an extended length of time of sword swing, which could be 15 seconds. It could be 25 seconds where I'm just throwing. Honestly, as long as I know they're there, I don't care if I'm getting hit. I don't even need to see them. As long as I can see where their body is, I train on a pell. So much of my life, I know where they are. And if things start going pretty well, I may actually just start doing things like changing the direction a little bit, just to do things, anything I can do to try and get another point. I only block intentionally when it's slow. When we're exchanging and things are very fast, I almost never try to block anything. I just try and score one more point than they do on me. Most importantly, I don't try and fight you for 90 seconds or 60 seconds. I really only try to fight you for 20. I like to make sure I'm up a point if I can by a hit and try and dodge, or maybe a hit and, and block something that they throw at me. 
and then I will just try and stay away, stay away. And when the time comes, and in my head, I'm just so ready for it, when we have the explosive uh, exchange of like 20 hits in a row. So, I hope that covers uh, my thoughts on the optimal duel. Yeah, uh, if I'm behind in points, and they're doing that to me and just staying there, then I have no choice but to be aggressive and be the aggressor and go for them. As long as I can keep it up, though, I will try and be the one walking backwards. Like I said, I feel it's so much easier for me to, to determine how much space is between my opponent if I'm the one walking backwards. Because I can walk slower and they'll be closer. I can walk faster and even to get out of the range. I might just stop and then we just go at it for 20 seconds. <clears throat> so that's my strat. I'm giving it all away. But it's good because there are a lot of people out here, I think, that can use this information. So I hope I helped you out. Like I said, just share this video with anybody you think might benefit from watching this long sword video I put together. I hope that helped you out. Wow, that was a long video. You know, I actually recorded a whole hour-long video and thought, I watched it and thought, man, I need to redo it. So this is actually take two. All right, so uh, if you watch this whole video, you deserve a long sword medal just for that. So like I said, I'm Bachata Knight. Uh, share with anybody that you think could use the info. Oh uh, man, I'll be at Carolina Carnage, of course, this year, fighting in Longsword. Hope to redeem myself now that I'm following the meta. What is the meta? Repeat after me. Quantity. Either being able to throw continuously or quantity of combos. And combos of five to six. I swear to you, if you can do those things, you'll never be beat. If you think about it, it's kind of just an obvious thing. The more you throw, the more you land. And even if someone blocks a lot of them, whoever throws the most is probably going to win. It just basically comes to that. But I'm hoping I'm, I'm hoping I'm opening up your eyes to the amount of quantity that you need. And besides, there are things we covered in here that are important, especially for new people, like you know how to pick proper armor, things like that. And the tricks I showed you here a little bit ago. All right, uh, I'm just wasting another couple minutes of your time now. So... Thanks for watching. Uh, plenty of more videos here in this channel, of course, like always, that relate to Boo Hurt Armored Combat. And we will catch you in another video. Thanks so much for watching.